All right. Welcome, everybody. I got it. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, as Andrea mentioned, my name is Adi Jaffe. I've been in this field for about 15, 16 years. I uh, got my PhD at UCLA studying psychology, but really the whole time focusing on addiction. Had my own addiction history, started with drinking at 14, then escalated until I got into pretty heavy drug use. By the time I was in my mid-20s, um, went to jail, went to rehabs. I mean, I, I went through a lot uh, in the early 2000s to get to this place. And really for the last 10, 15 years, my focus has been on taking the knowledge that I acquired when I was at school and helping disseminate it. And one of the reasons that I'm here and I'm excited about being here is I think that the system that we use to help people who struggle with addiction has it almost completely wrong, as close to completely wrong as we can have it while still calling what we have a system. Um, and I do a lot of the work that I try to do both in training professionals and in talking to people like you to dispel those myths and, and break apart the system on a, on a big level, right? By training people and offering alternative ways of looking at this, but maybe more importantly, dealing with people on the ground who are actually struggling and are looking for help. So I wrote this book. I don't know how many people have heard about this book or checked it out. It's called The Abstinence Myth. Um, obviously, as the name suggests, it talks about the fact that abstinence is not the only way to recover from substance use issues. And that's why MM in particular is very near and dear to my heart. As I mentioned, I used to own an outpatient treatment center and we ran an MM meeting, the only MM meeting in Los Angeles at the time. And we were very harm reduction or moderation plus sort of informed. Um, where people get stuck a lot is when I say that they think we don't believe in abstinence. And I think it's kind of a bizarre <laughs> assumption to make that because you allow for moderation or reduction in use, you somehow don't believe that abstinence is a thing. Uh, I called my book, The Abstinence Myth, half to piss those people off and half to make the book palatable to a lot of people who just don't want traditional recovery. And I'm going to kind of go back and forth between slides and just uh, not sharing a screen. But you know, the way I see it, what we're dealing with in addiction primarily right now is something along these lines. And that is, uh, let me just share right here. Everything is loading, boom. Perfect. Um, the way I see it right now, um, when you talk about addiction, you talk about a lot of different kinds of people. So I'm, I'm using case studies for people I've worked with before and I'll, um, I'll explain why you're in a second, obviously not their real pictures here. Uh, that is obviously pretty clear, I assume why. So this is Melissa, I write about her in the book. Melissa was an Orange County housewife, came to me saying, look, I'm an alcoholic, I need help. I've been trying to slow down or quit for years. It's not working and it's uh, ending my marriage. Ex sorority um, girl married the, you know, the guy that she met in college, very successful businessman, lived in a beautiful Orange, county house three kids with the pool in the back and the cars and the Range Rovers and all the stuff uh, and had been drinking to the point where she became a closet drinker uh, literally right vodka hidden in her shoes in the closet um, during that relationship and she had then tried to cut back and it didn't work and then was hiding it and it got caught and eventually had tried to stop for a number of years unsuccessfully until she eventually came to see me this is in that old treatment center um Next up, how do I advance these slides? I, I don't know Google Slides as well, sorry. Okay, next up, again, I apologize, not his real picture, but um, we'll, get, we'll call this guy Chris. Um, Chris was a rugby player, uh, six foot five, have like, you know, just almost like the opposite physically than the way Melissa presented herself. And he actually initially came for sex and porn related issues had, um, repeatedly cheated in his marriage and alcohol always played a role in those events so when he went out and when he cheated and when he acted in ways that were inappropriate outside of his marriage he was always drunk but he didn't come in for the um alcohol he came in for the cheating and the things that presented themselves on the front end his marriage was was literally um at its edge his wife said look this is the last time you either fix this or I'm out. And she gave him rehab as an option where he could spend, you know, 40 some, I think it was 45 or $50,000 for a month. He found an outpatient program that was about 25 grand. And then I don't know how, but he ended up finding our online program. And literally he said this to me when he first signed up, 
I'm completely skeptical that there's anything you can do for me, but you only cost about $800. That's what we were five years ago. Uh, and I'd rather spend that than spend $20,000. So let's see what you got. Next guy. And then we have Aaliyah. Ashley could have used a picture of Aaliyah. Aaliyah is one of those people who's now given us testimonials and, and left videos online. But Aaliyah is what I call kind of a kitchen sink drug and alcohol user. She'll use whatever she needs at any given moment. So it led to heavy duty meth use and opiate use and pills and alcohol and cannabis throughout her life, whatever was available, she was using to really suppress herself and her feelings. And by the time she found us, was on the verge of, and was actually trying to commit suicide. It just didn't work, gun jammed, um, thankfully. And so she went out on the highway, right? Driving in her truck, trying to find something to hit so she could die. Heard about us on the radio, stopped Mm -hmm. and enrolled in the program. And and the reason I'm showing you this is not so much for each one of the individual people, but I don't think there's anybody on this call right now who believes that these three people are the same. How many people on this call right now, and you can raise your hand and leave it in the chat, see all three of these people as having the exact same problem. Well, the the reason you're answering that way is that maybe I led you a little bit, but this is an MM meeting. If I asked this in a traditional recovery room, a lot of people would say, yeah, they're all addicts and alcoholics. And to me, this is one of the things that is most broken with our current system is there's just a clear assumption that if you struggle with drugs, alcohol, sex, food, porn, anything, you're an addict. 50 years ago, you were just called an alcoholic. It didn't even matter what you struggle with. And therefore, you should just do the things that alcoholics have to do. Um, I think we miss many boats on that front and we we miss many, many opportunities. But what I want to talk to you about today is what the issue is with using a system that we all know was created over, I mean, right around 100 years ago, but rest on on methods and techniques and things of that nature that were there even before that. Versus where we are right now and where we are in our struggle. So I'll end the presentation here for a second, if I can find my bar. And so that's that's really what I want to talk about here today is the fact that I don't know how many, maybe I should ask as a quick little poll, how many people here ever got engaged in kind of more traditional recovery channels? AA, non-AA, going to church, any of those, you know, traditional therapists, anybody who ever tried any of those things? One, two... Okay. Oh, I got two. I like this. The hands up and the, the hand. It's, <laughs> I think I was that person. All right. So we got at least like five, maybe even six people or so that, that answer this. Um, if you have ever tried that stuff, you know how limiting it could feel because no matter what answer you give, no matter what experience you share, it all gets filtered through a specific lens. But we know And when I say we, I mean the people who study addiction and drug use issues and alcohol issues, we know that there are really complex factors. And in the book, I talk about it, but even in the treatment world, if you've ever been to treatment, they talk about biology, psychology, and environment, at least. It's even called a biopsychosocial assessment, the thing you go into treatment with, and then nobody does anything with it. You fill out the survey, they use it to make sure that you really have a problem or at least label you for insurance companies, and then they leave it alone. And then they just send you to the groups and they do the things that they do with all addicts and alcoholics. And I'm here to essentially call BS on that and, and to just say it hasn't worked. It's historically not working. We all know the consequences of it not working. I can show you the slide, but over 70 million Americans struggle with alcohol and drugs. The 170,000 people die a year, by the way, just from alcohol. You add to that drugs were over 200,000 deaths costing $740 billion to society. And our current system helps 1%. And sometimes people freak out that I say, why why are we helping only 1%? And so I want to show you this real quickly. You guys know this because you're not using the primary system. But out of those 75 million people who struggle, two and a half million or so get help every year. That's 4%. Of those 4% who actually try, nine out of 10 fail. And when I say fail, I'm using a very broad definition of fail. Traditional treatment tries to get you to stop using, right? Abstinence. Within a year, less than 10% of people are fully abstinent. Some, some studies give you as much as 13, 14%. Some studies as low as five. I'm using the average, about 10%. So if 96% of people don't even use the help, and then 90% of people who use the help fail, we're helping less than 1% of people. And I don't know what to call that, but, but failure. Like if there was any if I was trying to do something and I would score less than 1% on it, I would consider myself doing terribly in it. Unfortunately, addiction is one of the only fields where even though there's this much failure, 
we literally constantly look at the people who are struggling as the source of the problem. And we all know this, whether you've known somebody who struggled or you're the person who struggles themselves. It's, this is the only place where like, if something doesn't work for you, you're told you're the issue. Like if I took a medication, and the medication didn't help me. Nobody would say, hey, you really need the medication to want to help you. Otherwise, what's wrong with you? And yet in addiction, this happens all the time. I don't think this has anything to do with why addiction doesn't work. I did a lot of studies on why people avoid treatment. I don't need to go into it in here. The point to me is much, much simpler. Different people come into treatment and they need help. And when they get confronted with what the help, what help is available, most people are just not interested. It's not the help they want. And the field for the longest time has looked at people like the people in this room and said, there's something wrong with you that you don't want the help. And I, I talk about this in the book quite a bit. And I, equal, I equate it to this. I think what the addiction field, the alcohol field, whatever you want to call it, the alcohol treatment field has done is the equivalent of opening up a restaurant, spending months on the menu, hiring the chef, hiring the staff, doing the decor, really doing the best you can, you know, picking the right spot for you. And, um, and then opening up and having nobody show up. Just the restaurant just sits empty day after day and the chefs have nothing to do. And then having the audacity to say, what's wrong with people? They don't know how to appreciate good food. People have no problem appreciating good food. And I think people want help for alcohol, drug issues, whatever. But if your method is flawed, if what you're offering is not what people want, then they're just not going to come. And to me, the power of something like MM is that it's fi there's finally a, a self-help group that offers people a major swath of people based on the research I did in my postdoc, 65 to 70% of people who struggle with alcohol are not interested in full, lifelong abstinence. 65 to 70% of people, which means that the entire addiction industry is built for only 40% of people who would even want it while leaving everybody else out in the cold. So what do we do instead? Well, what I think we have to do instead is we have to finally, for the first time ever, Give people what they actually want in the way that they want it when they're available and stop thinking of this notion. How many people have ever heard of this idea that, you, you know, if somebody really wants help, they have to hit rock bottom. Has anybody ever heard of that concept? I think that entire way of thinking came about because the system sucks so badly. It's so painful for people to engage in that. Yes, of course, to leave your family behind pay $40,000 to go away somewhere for a month um, and, you know, live with a bunch of people you've never met before in your life, you have to be pretty miserable. When, uh, before COVID, when I used to give these trainings professionally, I would be in front of a bunch of counselors and I would or therapists and I would say, I have an offer for everybody here. If you give me $60,000 when this um, session is done and then you come with me, I have a month of incredible adventures for you. It's going to be the best month of your life. It's going to be so incredible. You're going to go home at the end of the month and tell everybody that they have to do it because it's the best thing ever. How many people are willing to leave with me and give me $60,000 the next month? I never had a single taker. And by the way, I would figure out how to make this a really great month for them for $60,000. I don't make that much money doing what I do. For 60 grand, I'd give them the best month they've ever had. Nobody would ever take me up on it. Why? Because nobody wants to spend that much money. I don't even know how bad your life has to be. I mean, I, I know I got arrested for it. Um, your life has to be as bad as you can imagine it to decide that you're going to leave everybody behind for 30, 60, or 90 days. And even intensive outpatient treatment is 12, 15 hours a week. It's a nightmare. So nobody wants to do it. But I think there's a much, much easier, much better way to do what we need to do in reality. And so for that, I'll, um, I'll share a little bit here. And that is this. I studied, again, I studied addiction when I got my degree, the neuroscience of it, you know, what works and what doesn't in treatment. We know a lot about alcohol and drug use. We really, really do. So in terms of statistics, we've had tens of thousands of studies. We know how early what you drink and how long you've been struggling with drinking and the quantity, how they affect you. We know the impact on the brain. Uh, we understand really, really well what happens to the brain after long-term drinking, what happens to brain developmentally for alcohol and even cannabis and things of that nature. Um, we know what it takes to instill habits in people. We also have a lot of people who really truly want to help. You know, there are hundreds of thousands of people who work in this industry in the U S I really do believe that most of them want to help. I believe they got into this field for the right reason, right? They, they see people struggle. Maybe they've struggled before like I have, 
and they really want to be out there and help. And especially for those of you who've tried treatment before, there's still the same thing that happens in every treatment center. And that is you have all this knowledge over here on the left, big knowledge about addiction. And then when somebody shows up, Melissa or Chris, they show up to treatment, nobody knows what to do with them. And because we don't know specifically what to do with any one of you on this call right now, the answer for most treatment historically has been, well, just go to that group. We're going to do the same thing for everybody because we just don't know what to do differently. And I know only a few of you said that you've kind of been to treatment officially. So this might only apply to some of you. How many of you ever find yourself sitting in a group? You, were, you wanted help. You wanted things to get better. You were sitting in a group and you look around and you listen to the stories of people talking. You're like, I have nothing in common with any of these people. What am I doing here? Why, how is this going to help me? And I, I feel maybe badly for the person who's sharing right now, but this is not who I am. This is not my issue. I see one person has had that experience. All right. I'm not talking to you, Bonnie. So you're going to be my, I, I hope I'm right on this because I, I got a bad a thousand to be, to be right on this. If you ever said anything to anybody when sitting in a group like that and said, Hey, this doesn't apply to me. This is, this isn't what I struggle with. What's the thing you're always told? shut up. You don't understand what's going on. Stop trying to make sense of this. We know better than you. Be quiet. You're an alcoholic. Just deal with it. We know it's hard for you to admit. Just here's where you are. So at its core, even though we have all this knowledge, we ignore all of it. When we actually get somebody in for, to get the help, we literally pretend that everybody is the same one day and I had to get out of the program. Yep. Yeah. And, and you're not alone. So this to me is the problem. The problem that I set out to solve when I started Ignited after running a treatment center is how do we solve this? And you, you guys might know this uh, historically. I don't know how many people are geeks about science, et cetera, but we know that things that work on a big level, macro, are not the same as things that work on a small level. What do I, I'm, I'm using um, you know, physics here in the back, right? I'm using... Uh, just a formula for small particle physics. But the point is we all heard about like neutrons or string theory and quantum mechanics. We've all heard these terms before, right? These are really complex ways of understanding how things operate at the atom level. And each one of you on here right now, how many of there's 20, some of you on here right now, each one of you to me is a unique individual who's had specific experiences. You're like one atom. And it doesn't matter if I understand drinkers in general or cocaine users in general or moms who drink wine. I had somebody on a call earlier today when I was doing some training saying, well, you know, nobody goes into treatment for wine. I go, you, what are you talking about? A ton of people like he, in his mind, he already understood that alcoholics drink hard liquor. And I go, that has no bearing on reality. That's, that's just not at all relevant. People have experiences. You all, each one of you on here right now, you've had unique experiences that have led you to this moment. And we have to get to the place where we can understand what's going on for you, not generally what's going on for drinkers. Because if I treat each one of you as just somebody who drinks and therefore you became a quote unquote alcoholic, I'm missing the entire point. So this isn't a new idea. And what I'm about to say right now will sound like such common sense to you all. Um, but the five of you who've been to treatment before will recognize nobody does what I'm about to say. And that is how 20, other than me and Andrea, there are 24 other people on here. If the 24 of you are looking for help from alcohol, the specific method, the specific tools and specific regimen that will work for you is unique. Each one of you needs something slightly different than everybody else on here because, hold on, this is shocking, but you're different people. I know, I'm gonna let that settle for a second. You're not the same people. Different traumas, different experiences, different attachment experiences, different environmental influences. You have different friends now. You're married. You're not married. It's all different. And I, in the book, I talk about biology, psychology, environment, and spirituality. And there are probably other factors, but these are the big four for me. And if I can understand everybody's balance on each one of those, then I can understand their specific problem. And then I can do what my job really is. And that is just help you find the tools that help address the issues you're actually struggling with. So if it's biology, nutrition, exercise, and medication are probably going to help. 
If it's trauma, then obviously trauma-based somatic experiencing, EMDR, maybe some medication, um, you know, those sorts of elements would work, exposure therapy, et cetera. Um, psychological influence can be big T trauma, little T trauma, current struggles. Uh, I can't tell you the number of people, I just got off a call right before this about have relationships that are really burdening them and are causing them to drink or at least part, part of the reason they drink. And then something big that I've added into the mix. When I talk about spirituality, it has nothing to do with religion per se. If you find your spirituality and religion, that's great. But I'm talking about having some meaning behind your life. What I found over, I've worked with thousands of people at this point. And if you can't find a meaning to attach yourself to what Simon Sinek calls your why in the business world or contribution to society, helping some, somehow being big, something part of something bigger than yourself, that's a missing element that we'll need to work on. But my job is never for any one of you on here right now to tell you what you struggle with, but rather to ask questions and understand and then help you figure out your balance. And once we figure out your balance, there's a word for this. It's called adaptive treatment. I try something. We see if it works. If it works, we keep giving you more of it. And maybe we try something else or we add some other elements. If it doesn't work, we switch you to something else. Mind-blowingly complex, right? Um, the idea that everybody needs something different. But as much sense as it makes to us, having run a treatment center and having known dozens of people who run other treatment centers, I do have to tell you, it's near impossible to do an in-person. Um, because again, there's 20 some of you on here right now. And if each one of you needs something different, how do I even do that in a residential rehab? What do I do? I have 25 therapists running around and giving everybody individual care. So the thing that I want to talk to you about a little bit today, and you know, Andrea talked about Ignited, and I will bring up Ignited per specifically, but I think technology can do a lot to help each one of you on here right now get the help that you need in a more personalized way than ever before. And I'll present a lot of different methods or a lot of different approaches to what I mean by that. Um, but at the basic level, I want you to hear the first piece of it. And it's this, we now have more access, each one of us, to information and options than we've ever had before. Um, so obviously I have ignited, but how many of you have heard of This Naked Mind? Annie Grace's program. Uh, Tempest, which is Holly Whitaker's program. Um, there are a couple of these for specifically for men, but those are kind of maybe two of the bigger ones. Um, my friends at Cutback Coach have a, a texting app that allows you to kind of monitor your drinking. There are a lot of options now. Options that didn't exist before and you didn't have as easy an access to them than, you know, even five, 10 years ago. The hardest thing about the conversation that we're having right now is letting go of the urge to believe what everybody else thinks is true about people who struggle with drugs and alcohol. What do I mean by that? There's this thing that operates in our brain called confirmation bias. Has anybody heard of this thing before? It's a really simple idea. It works. Um, people have talked about the reticular activating system as being one of the brain systems that runs it. But your brain takes a lot of energy. And one of the ways that your brain organizes all the stuff, I'm sitting here talking to you, but there's another screen over here. I have a window to the outside world. and There's people passing by and cars driving. I've got other stuff around me. There's thoughts in my head. People are walking over my head right now because I'm at home and kids are up. There's a lot happening. Your brain has to understand what to pay attention to, what matters, and what it needs to put most of its energy into. Does that make sense? So the way it does that is by paying attention more to the things that it believes are important. Very simple concept, but it creates a bias for all of us. How do you know what's important to pay attention to? What you were taught is important. So I'll ask the question in this way. How many people on this call right now have ever had a family member who uh, became aware of your drinking issue? Any family member, I don't care, older, younger, peer, anything like that. Okay. A lot of us, right? It's, we may be good at hiding it for a while. It doesn't always get hidden for forever. For how many of the people who just raised their hand was the answer clear for those other people? And that was, well, you have to, you have to quit drinking because people who struggle with alcohol have to quit drinking. Okay, I see a lot of people raise their hand. You know, those people who told you that they weren't wrong from their perspective. 
the only thing they were told was that if somebody struggles with drinking, if they're an alcoholic, the only solution is to quit forever, right? So they just share their knowledge. They are right based on the knowledge that they have. They don't have any other knowledge. But then confirmation bias kicks in because they believe that the only way to deal with drinking is to quit drinking. Anytime that they find evidence that your drinking is causing you problems, they use it as evidence that they're right. But any times that drinking happens without causing you issues, the evidence gets ignored because it doesn't reinforce what they're doing. And the same exact thing happens to you, whether you like it or not. One of the things we have to work on the hardest at Ignited is because a lot of our people have been to traditional treatment before, is that shameful voice. We have a saying at Ignited, F shame is one of our mottos. You have this shameful voice in your head that even if drinking is going better than it's ever gone before, there's that little voice that says, yeah, but you really shouldn't be drinking at all. You're screwing this up. Why are you even playing with this? Stop drinking. You know you're supposed to stop drinking. And that voice will just not let you win, even if things are going well. And Michael, I hear that that hit home. I want to tell a story about that. Um, this woman in our program, um, I won't use her name, but slightly older uh, than I am, came in. She heard about Ignited. She had tried some medication, Altrexone specifically, and um, she was drinking 13 bottles of wine a week. That's almost two, 13 to 14. So about two bottles of wine a day. And had tried a lot of different things. This was the first time, the first year or so that she was really giving it an effort. So it hadn't been a long time, but she had tried, you know, therapy, AA and medication already before she found us. Two to three months after joining us, um, she was down to three drinks, three to six drinks a week. 13 to 14 is about the equivalent of uh, five, right? Five drinks per bottle. So about 13 bottles is 13 times five, right? It's about 65, 70 drinks. Went from that to three to six. She drank on one to two days a week. So she goes to her therapist that she's worked with many, many times before. And she comes, she wants to celebrate it because we track her drinking like an MM. We track her drinking in the system. She's goes to celebrate. And he goes, oh, I'm just really worried that you're still drinking. And so she comes defeated to our meeting because here she is wanting to celebrate a 97% reduction in her drinking. Overnight, she got an A. She got an A in drinking less if that was a class. And the only response was, yeah, but it's not a hundred. And that triggered me. You know, what I said before triggered Michael or hit home for Michael. I grew up in a home where if I didn't get a hundred or a 10 on a quiz or a test, then was like, well, wh how, why'd you miss these points? And, and maybe that's why I hate this black and white thinking so much because it's pretty clear to anybody, obviously to everybody in here, but it's pretty clear to everybody that if you were able to reduce your drinking by 90 some percent, it would be a success. But if you think about life as a black or white kind of world, it's not a success, it's failure. And I can't fathom the number of people, let's say in AA, let's say in traditional treatment, who managed to cut their drinking by 50, 60, 70%. And week after week, we're told they're failures. Week after week, we're told that they just are not hitting the mark and we're told to come back. And eventually it beats you down. Because it's hard to think of yourself as a success confirmation bias when everybody else tells you you're a failure. And so to me, part of the reason I wrote the abstinence myth is to make people understand, look, progress is progress, period. I don't care if you drink one sip less every day. Drink one sip less every day and see what happens three months from now and what happens to your drinking. Massive changes. But if every time you drink a sip less or one glass less or half a glass less, everybody around you tells you it's a failure, you start believing in it and you start seeing a failure and confirmation bias kicks in. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to beat out that idea that um, A, that abstinence is the only goal, which is part of the reason MM exists. But the other piece that is more important to me is that even if you do want to reach abstinence, that you hit it, you just, there's a moment where you hit abstinence. Whereas for the vast majority of people, everything is progressive, right? You move in and out. Full transparency, I'm very big on uh, not pretending when I present. That woman uh, in a meeting just the other day was saying, you know, I've been back, I've been drinking more. And, you know, I 
I've been doing this for 15 years. Very little shocks me at this point. I said, tell me what, what does it look like now? She says, well, last week I had nine drinks and I just, I'm just not really happy with myself. And I said, I can't say her name. I keep wanting to say her name, but I said, look, look at what you're talking about. When you first came in here, you're drinking 65 to 70 drinks a week. You went down to three. Then you went back up to six to nine and you're catching it again at nine. How amazingly powerful is it that you have now developed the ability to catch yourself slipping up when you are at still at about a seventh of what you used to drink before. And notice nothing changed about her behavior, but the perspective shifted. And I'm here to tell you, again, having worked with a few thousand people at this point, I've never identified a single person that I've worked with where if they're able to let go of that shame-based thinking, that black and white shame-based success failure kind of thinking, and then went diligently after tools that helped the next piece we're going to talk about here today, we're not able to substantially, substantially beat the consequences and the severity of their struggle. I'm not going to tell you that every single person has been able to beat it and meet abstinence, but for some people, abstinence is just not the goal. So it's not reaching it is not even something they're trying to do. And so obviously they're not going to reach it because it's not something that they want. And that leads me to the last piece. And then I do really want to open this up to questions. So in about three minutes here, I'll, I'll just open this up to questions. If you're going to experience success and you're going to let go of this black and white thinking, you have to find a way to measure that success. Because the thing about black and white thinking is that it's really easy to measure. I drank, I'm failing. I didn't drink, I succeeded. It's why everybody likes it. It's really simple. But I'm telling you right now, and you know this, the reason you even started looking at something like MM, the reason you went to therapy around your drinking or an AA meeting or rehab or whatever, was not because of the drinking. It was because of what happened because of the drinking. And in the same way, I'm going to tell you that the solution for your drinking problem and tracking is amazing and habit formation and having a community is important. But many of us forgot why we started drinking in the first place. But there was a time, I don't know when it was, reminds me of a call I had again yesterday with a woman who signed up with us. There was a time when you didn't used to drink. And you had whatever set of struggles you were experiencing in the moment. And then one day, and you may remember it, you may not, but you probably remember it. One day you drank for the first time or for the first time that it did a good enough job of fixing whatever it then helped you fix. And it was like magic. It just helped. I'll never forget that day. I was 14 years old. I was shy. I was anxious. I couldn't talk to girls. Um, and I was at a sleepaway camp. So I was like, I was awkward. I didn't want to talk to the guys because I felt like I wasn't as cool as them. I didn't, couldn't talk to the girls because I felt awkward around them. And then somebody handed out a handle of vodka and it was warm and disgusting, but I wasn't going to say no because I already felt awkward. So I just said, yes. I took three swigs just to prove how cool I really was. And it sucked. I mean, it almost made me throw up on the spot. 15, 20 minutes later, I felt better than I'd ever felt in my life. I could talk to the girls, I could talk to the guys and not care what they thought about me. I didn't know to give it a word, but I felt normal. And alcohol was not my problem. Alcohol was absolutely the thing that allowed me to function in everyday life. It's just what I forgot years later, right? I was, it was 11 years later that I went to rehab. What I never realized, I didn't even forget, it, I just didn't know it, was that I had a lot of work to do to feel like I belong. I had a lot of work to do to feel like I matter, like I am good enough, like I'm not hopeless, like I'm not a reject. I had to do all that work later, all of it. So for me, it got as far as meth was my drug of choice, but I just did everything I could to not feel those feelings of lack of belonging, worthlessness, et cetera. And I don't know what it is for you. It's not the same for everybody, right? We're all unique, but you all found a solution and the way we work at ignited at least is that the work that we need to do is really not on the drinking it's nice to drink less because it makes you more aware and it makes you remember better and it improves your health but the work we need to do is on the much more basic elements of your core being that have felt less than have felt unworthy have felt 
anxious, depressed, hopeless, or whatever the, the correct traumatized, right? So many people I work with have, have a deep trauma in childhood, pretending for a second that somebody, I had a Aaliyah, and she talks about it publicly, so I'm not discovering incest and then multiple abusive sexual relationships to tell, and, and by the way, including her mom, giving her to people who were producing porn when she was a teenager for drugs, to tell a woman like that, that she's sick because she has a drug problem is completely ignoring who she is as a human being. And I don't know what each one of your stories are, but they're unique, right? There's 25 of them on here. But I promise you one thing. If you walk all of us in here, step by step through how you got to this moment, every single person on this call would understand exactly why you drink the way that you drink. And so whether, you know, the reason I love MM again is it gives people who want to get better a place to go and explore what that means for them. And my ask of you as I open this up for questions whether ignited is the route for you or not, I care a lot less about. What I want you to hold on to dearly is a day where you drank too much, a day where you drank when you said that you weren't going to, a week where you blacked out. All of those, you can look at them as lapses, but the most important thing to do is do the best job you can learning what didn't work, what went awry in that situation. What can you focus on to make better the next time? What can you change in your life and in your circumstances? If you become diligent about that, there will come a day where you will look back and go, oh my God, I haven't, wanna, I haven't had one of those really heavy drinking days in a week, a month, a year, two years. And it looks shocking to you, but it's because you did the work to learn how you needed to get there step by step. And I've seen it work hundreds and hundreds of times. It's not a question for me of whether it can work or not. It's just a question of whether we're willing to put in the steps. And so with that, I will end my spiel. And I'd love to open this up for conversation and, and questions because I'd love to be able to help you guys if I can.